Okay. So it's amazing see, to see from uh, Steve's talk, you know, the complexity of uh, modeling the MJO. But on the other hand, how far we've come. And I don't think, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't have an S2S project now if it weren't for the uh, advances in the models in, in being able to predict the MJO. And it's really the, it's, it's, you could say it's the most important uh, source of skill on the sub-seasonal time scale that we're able to model. And uh, Steve talked yesterday about the stratosphere and uh, that, that's also a potential one, the land surface, but the, the MJO is the one that you know, the project has really been driven by. And then if you compare that with, with uh, ENSO, ENSO modeling, uh, I, people had quite good understanding and models of, the, of, of ENSO way back in the, in the 1980s. And uh, you, you could ask the question, well, how, how has uh, uh, ENSO prediction uh, skill increased since then, and if you look in the models, actually, we don't have much increase in skill since those early days of, uh, of uh, ENSO prediction. That, that, may be, that may be starting to change now, but uh, uh, I think that there's, more, there's also more to ENSO, ENSO prediction and modeling than, than, it, than is in those early, uh, early models of uh, Kane and Zbiak uh, intermediate coupled models. But nonetheless, Fair to say, I think that the, the understanding of ENSO is still still uh, in advance of of what of, of the MJO from what, from what Steve was saying. Anyway, for this talk, I, I think I can go through it fairly quickly, and I, we thought it would just be uh, useful to say something about uh, tailoring of forecasts. Uh, I'm going to particularly talk about seasonal forecasts, but thinking about how one could also tailor. Uh, information coming from sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts for use in for use in application. <coughs> so if I if I don't keep going, this is probably going to keep uh, turning off. Right. So I'll talk about the the workhorse for doing this regression models uh, for tailoring and cal calibrating seasonal forecasts. Uh, some some examples, uh, and then quantile. I'll say a few more words about quantile regression that I mentioned briefly on Monday, and so. As I mentioned on Monday, this is the type of thing we have for a seasonal forecast, but in terms of uh, the seasonal total of rainfall and in terms of, of tercile categories. And can we, can we make this more useful for, for particular specific applications? And so we, we showed this one as well as being, one has uh, two distributions here. One, one is the historical distribution of observations and uh, a forecast distribution that, that we're making of that. And, and the question would be, we, we talked about this in terms of seasonal total of rainfall, but uh, what about if we want to make a, a forecast distribution of some other quantity that's more relevant to an application? So the way that this is normally done is using linear regression models. And uh, this, is, this is the case here for, say, given a, a set of GCM hindcasts or, or other predictors, could also be some antecedent sea surface temperatures, for example, uh, and a set of observations, we can build a regression model between them. And so this is this, in this equation, x of t is the predictor and y of t is the predictand, but they don't necessarily have to be the same quantity. It doesn't have to be the seasonal total of, of rainfall that's the predictand. You could choose another predictand, and that's the essence of using linear regression models for uh, make it, making tailored forecasts, that you could take your predictor being some, some variables from uh, your GCM predictions, could be the seasonal total of rainfall, or it could be the wind fields, or some other, some other quantity from the GCM, and then predict what it, whatever it is that you like, if you have some observations for it as the predictand. So the bias is, is B, and uh, you estimate A and B by uh, minimizing the sum of squares or residual error term. And, uh, Regression models trained on GCM hindcast versus historical data uh, are called, called MOS correction sometimes. That uh, stands for model output statistics, so you may hear that term uh, MOS correction used uh, to describe this process. And you can use general, generalized linear models can be used to, uh, to uh, go to if, if your if you're, if you're, uh, observations are not uh, distributed in, in a Gaussian way, and we'll, we'll see that application of that to the quantile regression. So cr the choice of predictors, uh, as I said, they don't have to be the same quantity. The x doesn't have to be the same quantity as y. Uh, you can use more than one, more than one predictor, then you have a multiple linear regression. Uh, that, that often in the past has, has led to one of the main pitfalls in this, 
that if you choose a lot of, if you use multiple linear regression and you choose a lot of predictors, then uh, if you choose enough predictors, your residual error can re be reduced to zero by, by including enough of these. And if you include as, as many as you have sample points in your time series, then you, then you can make a perfect fit. And that will be the, uh, the classic uh, phenomenon of, of uh, overfitting. So the rule of thumb is that you need five or ten samples per predictor. And this is the, the essential point that if you want to train one of these models, you need lots of, lots of hindcasts. You need long hindcast sets and observational data to go with them so that you can train the model. And the rule of thumb is you need five or ten of these per predictor. So if you had three, three predictors, uh, you would need, in a seasonal sense, uh, 30, 30 years of, of uh, hindcasts and uh, 30 years of, of observation. So that then raises the question in the sub-seasonal case where we were seeing in S2S that often we, the hindcast sets are much shorter than we're used to dealing with for, for seasonal forecasts. And uh, so that, that's, a, that's a possible question. So the golden rule in doing this is that predictors also should be chosen uh, from, some, from some physical considerations. Uh, that's especially, especially relevant when, when uh, we're building statistical models where the, the X of T is not something coming from the, coming from the GCM, but it's antecedent sea surface temperatures. Uh, and you, you or could, for example, or, or some, some observed, observed quantity, where you want to make sure there's a physical relationship between, between X and Y, or you get into problems. And also, that the, the, when you're doing this, uh, you need to estimate the skill from, from some independent data. So choice of predictand. Uh, it could be, it could be a, it could be a high, higher resolution than the GCM. So if you think of your GCM uh, lower, being lower resolution, 100 to 300 kilometers, say, if you chose station scale precipitation, that would yield a statistical downscaling. So this is a, also a, a method of choice for statistically downscaling seasonal forecasts. It could be a, a, a more user relevant variable like a reservoir inflow, and I'll show, a, show a, an example of that. And so that's where we say that we will be tailoring uh, this to uh, a forecast. Or sometimes people say bespoke. It's all these clothing uh, <laughs> metaphors. So varieties of doing this. Uh, the, the, the equation I had before is so a single predictor and single predictand, just a univariate case, or the mul multiple uh, regression where I said you can get into problems if you have too many uh, predictors, but uh, one method of choice for dealing with this multiplicity of predictors, uh, also if, if you think that these predictors may be uh, uh, not, not line linearly independent, uh, is to use principal components regression where you take, uh, you, you calculate the, uh, the EOS and principal components of the, uh, the predictor set. And in that way, you can reduce the dimension to just a few, and they're, they're linearly independent of each other, so you don't have that problem of, of uh, multiple collinearity. And so that's the case. We, we call that principal components regression if uh, we're using PCs of some field. So it could be a precipitation field, uh, say, coming from, the, coming from a GCM uh, at, uh, over, over a region uh, used to uh, predict uh, y at a single single station that would be principal components regression, or in the full multivariate case where we have uh, multiple field, fields of predictors as well as fields of predictands, then uh, we have a, a full multivariate pattern regression, and uh, the method of choice for for doing that is canonical correlation analysis. So we not only do an EOF analysis of the the predictor field of the say the GCM. Uh, precipitation field and get the PCs of that, but we also do an EOF analysis of the observed field, say the, the station, uh, uh, station network, and get the, uh, the, the leading principal components of that. Uh, you need to do some truncation and, and choose the uh, truncation uh, limits, limits of that, uh, of those in, in those in that case. When you do this kind of uh, approach, you need to truncate to include only a few uh, principal components on, in, in, in each case. And that, that is, is often done under, under uh, cross-validation cross in, in maximizing some, some, uh, some skill measure under cross-validation. So 
this is a tool that's been developed at the, the IRI. Uh, Simon Mason is the, the person who's been uh, really uh, the one who's developed this tool almost single-handedly. It's had some help, but uh, uh, that's really his, his tool. It was motivated by the experience in, in, in a regional climate outlook for in Africa, where people were using statistical uh, regression to, to make their climate outlook for and pro, uh, forecasts, in which case they would often uh, choose statistical predictors, sea surface temperatures, uh, things like that. But often they, they were fishing for the predictors that, that gave them the best skill. And so these, these uh, regressions that they derived were, were overfit and it was giving forecasts that, that, were, that were way overconfident and weren't, weren't at all weren't at all accurate in, in, uh, in real time. So when you came to make a real forecast, it had no skill. But if you looked at, uh, looked at the training period where it was overfit, apparently you had a lot of skill. So that was a case where, where uh, the, the, the uncertainty in the forecast was not being communicated in, uh, uh, at all. And so that's where, where Simon had developed this tool to, to apply canonical correlation analysis and principal com components regression also in a, in a toolkit which would allow you to, to uh, also document this, the skill under cross-validation using uh, a whole slew of, uh, of uh, uh, WMO recommended uh, skill measures. So it's a Windows-based uh, toolkit. I don't know, uh, has anyone here uh, used CPT? Oh, there's, a, there's a few people. <laughs> so it, run, it runs under Windows. Uh, it's used, I think, in, in, in many of the, the, the national meteorological services use this for their, for their uh, seasonal forecasting around the world. And it's used in many of the, the regional climate outlook fora. I think it's become, it's become a method that's, that's actually been, uh, been adopted by, by WMO as a recommended method for, for uh, making making uh, regional scale, statistically downscale forecasts at, at local scale. Uh, typically, it's been used with, with statistical predictors in those regional climate outlook fora. But there's, an, uh, there's a big push now to, to use the dynamical model output from the, the global producing centers, uh, or the WMO lead center, or the, the North American multi-model ensemble. Uh, so to use predictors that are, that are uh, for example, precipitation fields from the GCM or, or predicted SST fields from the GCM is another popular way of doing it. There's also, a, uh, if you go to the, the IRI website, there's, there's also a, uh, a Linux version of this. It doesn't have all the graphics, but there's a, there's a Fortran codes Linux version, which we call the, the batch version. So I'll show a little example here of uh, tailoring uh, seasonal forecast to reservoir inflow, and this is the, the reservoir for Manila in the Philippines, the Angat Reservoir that supplies uh, almost all of Manila's water. And the, the, the key inflow season here is the October, November, December season into the reservoir. And this is just illustrating that you, you can use, in this case, because it's so connected with El Nino, if you have El Nino, you have a drought of the Philippines, and because of the seasonality of El Nino, you, get a, you, you can use the, the sea surface temperatures from the the, uh, the season before as an effective predictor to, uh, through, through, this, uh, th through a linear regression model with inflows into the reservoir. And it's a case where it's difficult to actually improve on this if you use GCM information. If you use GCM forecasts, you, you, can, hardly, you can scarcely improve on that, actually, because it's so, the, the ENSO signal is so strong and it, it's so well, well represented by by sea surface temperatures over, uh, over the Nino, Nino region. And uh, because you have that nice, that, that nice uh, seasonality of, of uh, El Nino, that you can, you can use sea surface temperatures from the boreal summer, late boreal summer, to forecast uh, October, November, December uh, inflow. So just to look at that in a bit more, a bit more detail, so what you need is a, a long historical time series of stream flow in this case. So it's contingent on having that observed. Uh, uh, record of the observational predictam quantity, and then a matching historical time series uh, of the predictor. So here it's September, actually September Nino 3.4 SST, but this could also be the, uh, the precipitation averaged over October, November, December forecasted from the GCM initialized, say on the 1st of October or the 1st of September, uh, ensemble mean. 
So here's my two time series of September uh, sea surface temperature anomaly in the Nino 3.4 region. And so we have data from October uh, from 1981 to 2006 for both time series uh, for the inflow and the SST. So here's our, our Y and our X. And you can see that they're quite nicely inversely correlated so that when you have uh, La Nina, you have higher flow, and when you have El Nino, you have lower flow. And what we do then is to make a cross-validated uh, hindcast of uh, uh, OND inflow where, where we use a technique of cross-validation where we, we leave out the year to be forecast uh, from the data to train the model, and then we, we make a, a prediction for the left-out year. And that is what is... We, we call here Y hat. It's the one that's been estimated for each of the left out years. And that's plotted in the green line here, uh, along with what actually happened, which was in, in, in the blue line there. So you can see that they, they, they mimic each other quite well. And this is, this is just a little schematic of, of that cross-validation cross uh, technique. So to predict 19, in this case, it's uh, 1951. Uh, we, we use the training period from all the other years uh, to predict 1952 likewise, et cetera. Uh, and then so we get predictions for, for these left out years that are, uh, are clean and that they didn't see any of, the, uh, any of the training data. And then you correlate that with what actually happened in those years to get an estimate of the skill. So that's called cross-validation. Sometimes it's done uh, if you think there might be some leakage actually ac across the, the years. You can leave out more years. So sometimes people leave out, say, a year either side or two years either side, or so leave three out or leave five out is 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 better if you have if you have enough if you have enough uh, if you have enough years. Uh, another an even better way of doing it is is uh, not to use any of the training period before the year you're, you're sorry after the year you're trying to predict. So to only use. Uh, data up to the year you're trying to predict to, to mimic as much as possible what would happen in real time. And uh, you, you can see that you obviously you need to have a longer training period to do that because uh, for predicting 1951, we don't have any years. We would have to have years before that. You would have to have a 30-year 30 uh, 30 period, say, before that to be able to do that, sort of that, that technique, which is, which is the best one if you, if you have enough data. But you see that uh, mentioning it time and time again that you need you need long hindcast set and long historical uh, records to be able to construct these models. So the the uh, then you can look at the error residuals uh, once you've fitted this model, and these should be uh, approximately normally distributed for this for this to be the, this the, for the technique to be valid. And you can see that well, it's not too bad in this case. And just, just to mention that if you look at the uh, Y time series, this is our, our inflows, you can see that it's not too badly skewed. So what you can do, if, if this is very skewed, you can, you can transform it using, using a, a statistical transformation like a Box-Cox transform or some, uh, uh, some, or some quantile, quantile empirical transformation to, to make, it more, make it more Gaussian. Because it, this is, this is uh, based... This, the linear regression based on, on Gaussian uh, assumptions. So you can see that it's fairly well. These are fairly Gaussianly distributed. But if we came down to be looking in the, in the sub-seasonal uh, context at, at weekly rainfall, for example, weekly average rainfall, it, it might not be the case. And so I think there's a question as, as to whether or not this technique is, is uh, how applicable it is on, on sub-seasonal scales. So we're talking about uh, getting getting. Uh, I'll show you something univariate. I mean, how do we get a how do we get a, uh, a a PDF? How do we get a distribution out of that? So essentially, what we're doing is there we're, we're predicting the ensemble. We're, we're predicting the, the mean of the the forecast distribution. So we assume a normal distribution uh, with a mean given by the regression model. So we predict the mean. That's the only thing that we predict with this model, is to predict the mean. So somehow, so we can get this shift of the distribution, but somehow we have to estimate the spread of the distribution to get the standard deviation of our, our Gaussian forecast distribution. And uh, this is typically estimated from the spread of the errors of the past forecast. So the, the error residuals are from, from, from hindcasts. 
and uh, that, that's just uh, just depicted in the slide. So, the if you fit your 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 model under cross validation, these are all the hind cars. So we can compare the 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 hind cars in the green with the uh, the observations in the red, and for for each one of those, there's a there's a residual error, and we if we take the uh, the, uh, we calculate the variance of, the, of those errors. We can use that as the, uh, the uh, spread of our forecast distribution. And so we can get, we can get uh, a PDF out of our, our regression model in this way. So that, that's typically how regression models are, are used to, to calibrate uh, forecasts. Uh, you'll use some past performance of the model to get the, uh, get the spread of the distribution. So if you're, you're if your if your uh, if your model is is very accurate, then you'll have a smaller spread in terms of those error residuals. If the error residuals are large, then you'll have a large spread, and you'll you'll have a wide wide distribution. So that was for reservoir reservoir inflow. Uh, this is a case where it's been done for the Philippines for rice production. So rice production in the uh, the this is the January to January to June uh, dry season, and uh, this is all tabulated. You, you can find this uh, on the web, tabulated by by uh, uh, the uh, I think the Food and Agricultural Organization. You can find crop production statistics for for countries around the world, and this is done for two cases here uh, using regional statistics, uh, regional crop productions on the on the left, and and provincial production on the right. And so what we've done is for we have these records for, 2000, for, for 1980 through, through 2007, and we've used those rice productions as our y variable. And then as our x variable, we've used the uh, GCM uh, predicted precipitation for the October to December season. Uh, I think that is initialized on, on, uh, on June, June, June 1st. And so what's shown here is the anomaly correlation skill for those. And so you can see that in some, in some, for some, some of the regions, we, we have a good, very good correlation skill of uh, uh, over 0.6. Uh, many, many, of the, many of the regions or provinces don't, don't have any, st any, any skill, but you, you can see that there, there, there are some in which there's some, some reasonable skill. And again, this is through this, this, uh, in the, the impact of El Nino really on the, on the region. Uh, I think this is leave one, leave one out, yeah. Or it might have been leave three out, I, f I forget. But it's not splitting the time series. This was the one that uh, Vincent showed yesterday. Uh, onset date uh, over, over, the, over the maritime continent, where here our, on, uh, our y variables is, is the onset date, onset date anomalies, and our x variables are the uh, sea surface temperature over the over the uh, tropical Pacific and, and, and maritime continent region from July, and then at the bottom is the cross-validated anomaly correlation skill, and you can see that that in that case are also getting up to some pretty high values of of, of over 0.7, and we did that also with station data, and you you see you see some some values of I'd say of the order of sort of 0.5 uh, in in the better regions. Uh, over 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 Java, uh, southern southern and southern Borneo. Here's a, another example of uh, predictans that that could be something different from seasonal total. So what we've looked at here is uh, some daily rainfall data from the India Met Department and calculated as as Vincent did yesterday, making this decomposition for the seasonal total be the number of rainy days times the mean intensity of rainfall. And this is anomaly correlation score of cross-validated regression with observed uh, tropical Indo-Pacific SST, uh, 1901 to 2004. So there's no, actually, there's no, there's no lead time here. This is using concurrent SST. So it's a method here of showing, well, what's the potential predictability from uh, sea surface temperature 
in, in these three quantities. And as, as Vincent was showing yesterday, we, we, see, we, we often see this, where we have more spatial coherence in the rainfall, uh, rainfall occurrence field than we do in the intensity field, just because of the kind of things that Steve was talking about, that, that uh, tropical convection is, is a very noisy is a very noisy phenomenon. So if you take a, a spatial area, you, you, the, the intensity on a particular day would, would vary greatly over, over, over the area, but it, it might be raining at some point in the day everywhere so that you have a smoother field for uh, rainfall occurrence. And so it's a way to, in, in seasonal forecasting, it's a way to, it can be a way to filter the field, to filter out a, a, a more predictable part. And so a question here is would that, could you actually do that uh, for, for uh, daily, uh, on, the, on a sub-seasonal scale, if you took, if you took a, a weekly precip, if you look at the number of rainy days in the week, perhaps that is actually more predictable than the weekly average of rainfall itself. I'm going to skip over that because that was uh, uh, what Vincent was talking about yesterday and I, I, in the interest of time. I just wanted to show uh, that, that we had... The, this thing about rainfall frequency versus rainfall amount. We had a we had a workshop in Singapore, and Raisan was there uh, in the in the back there somewhere. Uh, in, in this this was a while back in, in 2007. On but that was also the thing that uh, that uh, Raisan is going to be talking about after the break. Uh, the, this was a workshop on seasonal interseasonal climate prediction and applications uh, way back then, and uh, so that maybe that's like a forerunner of S2S, and. What, what each country did was to bring its own data, uh, rainfall, daily rainfall, as well as uh, daily rainfall. And then we made uh, two predictands. One was the, the rainfall frequency, or we call it the number of dry days. And the other one was just the seasonal rainfall total. And each country used, used CPT to make, to make some downscalings from GCM forecasts for March, April, May season and then just plot the skill score on, on, this, on the map. So we gathered all the countries' uh, outputs together on one map. And so the size of the circle is the anomaly correlation. So uh, I think you, you probably can see it best in the color bar here. So the deeper blue is getting up to sort of point, point 0.6, point 0.7, point 0.8. But what I want you to notice is that the ones on the right where we're looking at rainfall frequency tend to have larger, deeper blue circles than the ones on the, on the left. So you can especially see that over the, over the Philippines and uh, over Malaysia, uh, also, also over Thailand. So I think that, that's, that was uh, quite, quite a remarkable result uh, back, back, way back then. So in the last uh, five, ten minutes, I just want to uh, talk about what uh, another variant of, of regression that might be more uh, applicable on, on the sub-seasonal time scale. So quantile regression. The ult and I showed this result already on Monday, but I'm just going to show you a little bit about the background of this on, on the next couple of slides. So the ultimate goal of regression analysis is to, mod is to model the conditional distribution of the response variable, our, our, our y variable, given a set of explanatory variables. So this is generally called distributional regression because you want to have the whole distribution. You, you, don't, you don't just want to get, get the, the, the mean of the distribution like we did in, in the Gaussian case and then we had to estimate the spread in some other way. So this, this is quite general and there, there, are, there, there are various parametric and non-parametric ways of, that people have used to go about that and I'm not going to, I'm not going to describe them. I'll just uh, mention this uh, quantile regression as being uh, one example of this, where the predictand is, is a quantile of the forecast PDF. So we say we're, we're interested in the probability of exceedance of the median or the 80th percentile or something. We we'll choose our quantile, like we were talking about on Monday, uh, that we're, the, I showed you that IRI map room, which we call the flexible forecast, where you can choose your your quantile and get the probability of exceeding or not exceeding that. And in, in that case, we use a, a Gaussian methodology or transform Gaussian to get to, to that in the case of the IRI seasonal forecast. But this is a, a method that's been used, uh, I think, quite a bit in, in weather forecasting. It was in, introduced into the, into the weather forecasting community 
by, by Dan Wilkes, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from his paper here in 2000, 2007, 2008. And it's been used by people like Tom Hamill to look at, at medium range weather forecasts or, or uh, TIGI, TIGI data. So in this case, a logistic regression is well suited to predicting a probability rather than, rather than a measurable physical quantity. Uh, and so that's what that looks like here. Here's the, here's the logit or the uh, logistic regression where this is, the, this is the log of the odds, right? This is the, the P is the probability of something happening minus, uh, divided by the probability of it not happening. So that's the odds. And this is the log of the odds. And that is the, that, that is the predict and, the thing that we want to predict. Uh, and we base that, that on some predictor, var predictor variables, the, the f of x, so x is the predictor. So p is the, in this case, it's the probability of not exceeding a particular quantile. So that, that the, the equation is, is linear in, on the logistic or on the log odds scale, as you can see here. So here's an example of that from, from Dan Wilk's paper, actually 2009. And what, what, what's shown in the paper is uh, forecast from the NCEP GFS model, and it's accumulated uh, week two precipitation for particular places in the US. So this is a, a weekly average. I'm showing you a particular forecast uh, weekly average for 28th November through the 2nd of December 2001 for Minneapolis. So as X, they take the GFS uh, ensemble mean precipitation at, uh, at the nearest grid point and they square rooted. So because this is, we're, we're getting down to shorter time scales, you can make, you can make it uh, more, more Gaussian by, by uh, transforming it in some way. So typical in rainfall is to do something like square root or cube root. So if you think about some big, big uh, extremes, they get compressed down by, by doing that. And <clears throat> P is the probability of not exceeding uh, various, various quantiles. And so this, what is shown in this graph is, is individual, individual re regressions for different quantiles. And so I colored in the red one here is the median. This is the probability of uh, not exceeding the median, so the cumulative probability up to the median. And what's plotted along the x-axis here is the, the ensemble mean precip from the, from the model. And this is all cr trained under cross-validation as well. And... Uh, so it's showing as, as, uh, as the uh, ensemble mean uh, precipitation predicted by the model increases, then the probability of, of uh, getting, less, uh, getting less than the median, obviously, is decreasing. So the, the curve is sloping down to, to the right. And the way that this has been done is using training data window uh, of, of plus or minus 45 days around, around the forecast date to train to train the regression model and get the, uh, get the, uh, the coefficients in this, this f of x. So what, what you see, he, he did that so that the red one is doing that for the median, but then have also done it for some other quantiles, for the 10th, 10th percentile, the, the, the 33rd percentile, uh, the 60, 67th percentile, the 90th and 95th. And what you see there is there's, some, there's a problem because they, they're crossing over each other, and we, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> so doing individual regression is, is, uh, for different quantiles is, 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 not, is not well posed, and that's the sense of his paper. And what he introduced uh, in 2009 was this, this methodology of extended uh, logistic regression. So in normal case, the lines may, may, may cross, but uh, doing this will, will alleviate it by introducing this, this additional term here. So Q is the quantile, so it's just what we had before. It's, it's the, 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 the probability of not exceeding the quantile. And what we have here is uh, some function of that quantile. So this, this specifies parallel functions of the predictors X, whose intercepts in, increase monotonically with the increasing threshold Q. It's a, it's a way to e ensure that uh, those curves don't cross. And you can fit this uh, in MATLAB using the GLM, GLM fit, for example. And so here's the result from his paper of doing that. So the one on the right is what I showed before, when you're just doing individual 
individual uh, quantile regressions for different quantiles. And then this is the result of, of introducing this additional term, g of q here, where the, the functional form is, I think, the square root of q is what's, what's used for g of q. And you can see now that we get, uh, it's enforced these, uh, para it enforced these uh, regression lines to be parallel, so, so it's well behaved. <laughs> And this is the one that I showed, I showed this on Monday, a uh, uh, preliminary case from Nic Nicola Vigo at, at IRI, uh, where he's applied, applied that formula uh, using, using GLM fit uh, here to the C CFS we forecast uh, over the, over the uh, North America for the, this is showing July, August, September for the 1999-2010 period from, this is using S2S. It's actually using S2S data from the S2S database. And as I show, what I'm showing here is the reliability diagrams. He did this for, for the, the quantiles here are the, uh, the 33rd and the 36th and the 66th. But uh, one interesting thing is that you can train this on, on uh, use, using tercile categories, but then calculate for any any quantile you like. So it's a way to get a flexible format forecast like we do have already for the seasonal forecast. But uh, this, this, I think this method may be better suited to, to sub-seasonal where, 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 you're, where you're looking at weekly instead of seasonal. It, it's probably a, 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 good, a good technique for, for, doing, for doing seasonal forecasts as well, actually. And so you can see there's a fairly good uh, reliability showing week one through week, week four in the different colors for the below normal, uh, near normal in the middle of the distribution and, and uh, above normal we're starting to get, get uh, a, bit, a bit off at the higher uh, predicted values for the above normal category. So it's starting to be a bit, a bit uh, uh, uncalibrated. But you see you're getting worse as you go from week one to, uh, out to week four. And maybe there's still something we need to work on a bit there. At the moment, we're using the square root of the, of the ensemble mean of the CFS forecasts, which have, this, have four ensemble members. And this is integrating over daily starts, actually, with that model all throughout the season. So we're not using, we're not using weekly starts. We're using all of the starts. And so they're, they're all overlapping with one another as well in the weekly, weekly averages. And it's done separately for every grid point on, in the domain. So I think that there's techniques that have been introduced for thinking about how you might also be able to uh, uh, pool over grid points and, and, not, and not, have, not be fitting this individually for, for neighboring points. Because you may also have a, an issue that this is all wavering around a lot on, on the grid scale, and you, and you don't want that to happen. Yeah, that could well be the case. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we should we should plot the uh, the histograms of the the issuance of the different uh, different categories, and then you'd see that the these ones are, are rarer than than in the middle. Yeah, so it may be to do with um, more extreme events. So main points: seasonal forecasts are sometimes tailored. Uh, expressing in terms of a predictand of interest, like rainfall frequency, monsoon onset date, could be a, a drought probability, river flow, crop yield. Uh, this can also be a form of uh, forecast calibration or, 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 or downscaling. I should say this is using, using regression models according, according to the, the choice of your, your predictand. So this would be a, a forecast calibration as well if you just were to choose the, uh, the seasonal rainfall itself. Uh, at, at, uh, on, on your scale of interest. So you, it'll be a sort of combination of statistical downscaling or, or forecast calibration and forecast calibration as if you just look at, at the seasonal rainfall itself, whereas we can, we're, as, I, as I showed, the, the technique is flexible, so it allows you to choose the predictand that you like. Uh, regression models, 
using uh, GCM uh, ensemble mean forecasts uh, and, and antecedent climate conditions. And uh, this could be some, could be some variables from, from the GCM, uh, usually Gaussian or transformed Gaussian. Uh, most regression models are limited to this conditional mean as a function of the predictor. And you need to, to get the spread some other how. But uh, this uh, interesting uh, technique of quantile regression using extended logistic regression, which has been used in weather forecasting, and that, that we're, we're looking, at in, looking into this as a way of, of doing this for, for subseasonal forecasts. So I'll stop there. Thanks.